Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to another archaeogastronomical adventure. This is the Delicious Legacy Podcast, and I'm your host, Thomas Dinas. Thanks for tuning in for what is going to be a very special episode. Recently, we have reached 100 episodes on the podcast, and also this month, we celebrate uh, the four years of the existence of this podcast. So I'm very excited for today's episode, because it's a special one, with um, many, many of the past guests and friends of the podcast and patrons as well, telling us their favorite historical recipes or ancient dishes or cookbooks from the past, which ones and why. So, without uh, further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's special episode. So, we have Louis Bassett from the Full English Podcast, who was uh, my guest on episode 7 of season 4, which was released back in uh, November 2023, telling us about his favorite historical recipe. So I want to share with you the earliest known recipe for a dish involving pineapple. It comes from a professor of botany at Cambridge University, a man named Richard Bradley, and it was published in the early 18th century. The recipe itself is pretty vague, as tends to be the case with these old recipes, and it just basically calls for baking pineapple in pastry and serving it with cream. I've made a tartar tan with pineapple that works pretty well, especially if you grill the peeled fruit before mixing it with a caramel in a pan and sticking a pastry lid on top. Although Bradley's recipe is clearly very bare bones, it's the symbolism of pineapple that I really love. Pineapples were a wonder in the 18th century, where elites in Britain used them mainly for display at their grand dinner tables. In fact, a single fruit was often loaned out for parties, making its way along upper-class dinner circuits until almost rotten, and then turned into marmalade. Vast amounts of money were spent on trying to cultivate pineapples in hot houses. And in fact, the pineapple was so symbolic that you can find its traces in architecture everywhere, from gateposts up and down the country to the towers attached to St. Paul's Cathedral in London, where the plan had been to have a pineapple on top of the main dome itself. In the end, they went for a cross, but the pineapple was a close second. This is uh, Dr. Neil Battery, who was a uh, guest on the podcast twice on season four, very recently, episode 11, when we talked about Elizabeth Raffald, Hannah Glass, and other 18th century cooks. And also, he was a guest talking about uh, the history of sugar when he released his book um, a couple of years ago. It was uh, on season two, episode 27, back in October 2022. Hi Thomas, Neil Buttery here. Well done on reaching your 100th episode. My favourite historical recipe I made all the way back in 2015. I've yet to replicate it and it's mutton to eat like venison. There are lots of recipes for this from the 17th century onwards. The idea is you marinate, uh, well a leg usually, but sometimes a neck of lamb or mutton for four or five days in red wine and it's magically transformed once you've cooked it into venison. I wasn't expecting much from it, just a nice leg of lamb at the end, I suppose. The most basic recipes, such as the one you will find in The Experienced English Housekeeper by Elizabeth Raffold, published 1769, it's just a case of marinating your meat for four or five days in red wine, drying it off, sometimes covering it in pastry, or just roasting it. And that's it. Some recipes like you to use the blood of the beast and some recipes include a bit of red wine vinegar and that's what I did vinegar red wine few herbs and spices oh by the way you can transform a leg of pork into a leg of wild boar using the same process but use cider instead of red wine and cider vinegar instead of red wine vinegar well after marinating for four days it produced the tenderest leg of lamb 
I have ever cooked at home, and it was absolutely indistinguishable from venison. And here's what I wrote about it at the time. This is one of the most delicious things I have ever cooked and eaten. It's beautifully gamey, but with the moist succulents you would expect from lamb or mutton. It is magically transformed. Witchcraft can only be to blame. So there you go. Cheers. Bye. We also have um, one of the first guests of the podcast, uh, Ned Palmer, our author and cheese uh, monger extraordinaire, which uh, first, uh, firstly came to the podcast as a guest uh, in season one, episode four, all the way back in February 2020. Subsequently, he was back for an interview on episode on season two, episode nine, where he talked about um, his new book, A Compendium of British and Irish Cheeses. And um, yeah, here he tells us his favorite cheese recipe. Hi, Tom. Congratulations on your 100th episode. That's an amazing achievement. Um, as a celebration of that, I'm going to tell you about one of my favourite cheese recipes. Actually, to be really truthful about it, it's my wife Imogen's favourite cheese recipe and she's what she likes to have for her birthday, which is on the 1st of January. So it's a very special day. Every year I offer her options like champagne and scallops and she goes welsh rarebit and i say um caviar on toast welsh rarebit so that's how nice it is it's basically a form of really fancy cheese on toast where you make a kind of roux with flour and butter if you follow fergus henderson's recipe which is always an excellent plan you might add some mustard powder to that and um some guinness or in my case because i'm fancy i like to add the colonel breweries export india porter at a heartening seven percent to give it a real bit of grunt the traditional cheese for a welsh rare bit would be um cheddar but it being welsh i like to use trithawans called a with carefilly which not only has the lovely fresh zesty centre and a creamy outside but a kind of velvety mould rind and I grate some of that rind in as well for its peppery heat. Basically you just melt all that together, chill it in the fridge, turn it into a paste, put it on bread, stick it under the grill, cook it till it bubbles and then drink it with the rest of the export India porter, enlivening that perhaps the splash of champagne. A note on the um, the name, because it's a funny name Welsh Rarebit, is that originally apparently it appears according to the Oxford English Dictionary, as Welsh rabbit in the early part of the 18th century. And this might have been a bit of a joke on to the Welsh people's disfavour because, you know, Welsh people were too poor even to have a, a rabbit, so they have to make do with toasted cheese. A far more pleasant explanation is that the Welsh had a massive love for toasted cheese, such that when St Peter was tired of all the Welsh people in heaven, he just went to the gate and shouted, Toasted cheese is here! And they all rang out and he locked the gate. The English felt that rabbit wasn't a sophisticated enough sounding dish, so they, in the the later part of the 18th century, took to calling it Welsh rarebit to make it sound more posh. Fergus Henderson calls it Welsh rarebit, so I stick with that because he knows what he's talking about. Anyway, I hope you enjoy that. Congratulations again on your 100th episode, and here's to 100 more. We also have uh, Brigitte Webster, who was a guest on Season 3, Episode 29, on September 27th, 2023, and she's an expert on all things Tudor. So here is her favourite recipe. Hi, I am Brigitte, the author of Eating with the Tudors, and one of my favourite to the recipes is making pancakes. There are several pancake recipes by different authors from the 16th century and their ingredients vary slightly, but most Tudor period recipes include alcohol and spices mixed in with the flour and egg mixture. English recipes generally use ale and cream, where French ones use wine instead. The spices are sugar, ginger and cinnamon, and they give pancakes a bit of a tasty kick. I love making Tudor recipes because they are prepared the same way today, only with the extra flavours they transport you right back into Tudor, England. 
Of course, you can put modern chocolate, spread, jam or lemon on them, but the Tudors only sprinkled them with sugar. And that is exactly how I enjoy them. I hope you do too. And here is Christine Carrick uh, from uh, the YouTube channel Bake Across Europe, where she bakes historical goodies from all over the continent. Uh, and she was a guest in season four, episode three in October 25th, 2023. Hi, I'm Kristen from the Bake Across Europe YouTube channel. My favorite traditional recipe is apple strudel from the book Coffee House by Rick Rogers. The strudel dates back to at least the 17th century and it's made by stretching dough until it's paper thin and rolling it up with a filling of apples, sugar, cinnamon, raisins, and walnuts or almonds. It's my favorite because of how crispy and flaky the dough becomes and I'm so amazed by the first person who thought to stretch dough across a whole table to make it so thin. And this is medievalist and food historian, Dr. Christopher Monk, who was a guest in the podcast twice, more recently on season three, episode 15, where we talked about interpreting medieval recipes for the modern kitchen. Uh, and this episode was released um, on May 2023. Uh, have a listen to his favorite historical recipe. My favorite historical recipe that I've actually recreated is chichets, smoked chickpeas in broth. So the smoked chickpeas are engulfed in a silky, spicy, cheesy, egg yolk enriched, chickeny broth, and it's all brightened with saffron. The dish is found in the late 14th century cookery treaties of Richard II of England, but there are a number of chickpea recipes in the contemporaneous Italian Latin work, Liber de Coquina, and those have influenced my own version of chiches. Now, I love the idea of smoking chickpeas I do use a hobtop smoker, by the way, rather than place my chickpeas overnight in the ashes of a medieval oven. But that smokiness, it marries so well with the spices in the dish, and those are ground black and long pepper, nutmeg and a hint of cloves. And those spices are my version of the medieval English powder fort mix, which we don't have recipes for. So I've been heavily influenced by an Italian recipe for strong dark spices. The addition of cheese and egg yolks, which give this wonderful silky creaminess to the broth, is from the Italian sources. And then I confess to adulterating the whole with one of my favorite spices, ground roasted cumin seeds. Cumin, however, was used in the 14th century in English cookery, so I don't feel too inauthentic. And well, it, it just moves the dish on to a whole other level. It's real comfort food. Heaven in a bowl is how I think of it. And this is uh, Kyle Glover, friend of the podcast for many, many years now, and fellow podcaster with uh, the History Rage podcast. So let's hear about his favorite uh, historical cookbook. Hello, my name is Carl Glover and I'm a long-time listener of the Delicious Legacy podcast. Now, I've not been able to narrow down just one particular historical recipe that I like the best. I'm going to talk a little bit about my favourite historical cookbook instead. This is the Liber Cure Cucurum, an English cookbook from around about the mid-15th century, and I've actually had the privilege of handling and reading the original manuscript copy of this book held in the British Library. It's quite a small thing, slightly larger than a pocket-sized notebook, with two or three recipes on each page, and the title of each recipe simply but very delicately decorated with red and blue ink. But what makes this book really special is that not only is it an English collection of recipes from over 500 years ago, it's written in a recognisably Northern English dialect, with the scribe possibly coming from Lancashire. Not only that, it's also written entirely in rhyme. In fact, one of the earlier descriptions calls it a curious poem on cookery. 
For me, this small cookbook represents the joy of historical and particularly medieval cooking. It shows that for them, it was not just about survival or food simply as fuel, but something to be enjoyed, and for the process of cooking and creating that food to be something enjoyable in itself, or at the very least, memorable. Another friend of the podcast, Michael Zanfardino, tells us that his favourite historical recipe is a riff on one uh, that appears in the classical cookbook from uh, Andrew Dalby and Sally Granger. It's a version of a chicken salad from the Roman late Republican early imperial time, and the salad consists of diced chicken, raisins, pine nuts, cucumber, coriander, mint, and pecorino cheese. It's topped with fish sauce, olive oil, red wine vinegar, ginger, and honey dressing. The salad is great, served uh, on some crostini-like cuts of crusty bread, and in uh, Michael's opinion, it beats most of the mayo-based chicken salad recipes out there today. And this is from Michael Zanfardino. And now let's hear from uh, Jay Raffel, uh, who was a guest on the podcast on um, episode 28 of season 3, which was released on 20th of September 2023. Uh, and it's... Uh, all about uh, A History of the World in Ten Dinners, their book with Victoria Flexner. And here's Jay with his favorite historical recipe and why this is it. Friend of the podcast, Andrew Kenrick, and one of the guests as well, uh, who came to the episode to talk about um, the legendary Gourmand Apicius. Um, his recipe, his favorite historical recipe, is obviously from Apicius. And he tells me that um, he loves almost all of the Apicius recipes that he cooked. But um, Andrew thinks um, his favorite was uh, the mallet dish in dill sauce. And for Andrew, mallet uh, always brings to mind some of the extravagant stories uh, of the early empire. The competition amongst the wealthy to buy larger and larger specimens and the Tiberius' uh, famous encounter in Suetonius with the fishermen and so on. Plus... Apicius was supposedly best known for his sauces, so it seems remiss to include the recipe without a sauce. He also tells us that he loves uh, how the fish and the licks took a violet hue as it baked. So, there goes the recipe, and it's Apicius Vinidarius 14. You make mallet in dill sauce like this. Scale the fish, wash it, and arrange it in a dish, adding oil, liquamen, wine, a bundle of leek and coriander. Put it to cook. Put in a mortar pepper and dill seed, pound it, add oil and a lesser amount of vinegar, flavor with wine and passum, transfer to a pan, bring it to the heat, thicken it with starch and pour it over the fish, sprinkle pepper over it. And this recipe is uh, from uh, the friend of the podcast, Andrew Kendrick. Hi, this is Chef Gia Rifle, and in our cookbook, a History of the World in 10 Dinners, we cover a lot of ground, so it's very difficult to pick a single dish that might be my favorite. However, one that is closest to my heart is vinegar and stew from 10th century Baghdad. This is a period of incredible intellectual and culinary sophistication. And when they're not inventing algebra, they're eating an incredible diversity of dishes. And one thing that characterized these dishes was a love of sourness particularly sourness of vinegar, but it could be sourness of fermented dairy products, sourness from the juice of unripe grapes. And the most beloved of these dishes was a vinegared stew, which involved lamb and beef cooked with spices and saffron and a lot of vinegar and finished with a lot of sugar. Sort of like sweet and sour taste we know today. Um, this could be a single dish or it could be an entire meal because it'd be garnished and garnished and garnished and I quote, so that it looks like a flower orchard embellished and ornamented with all kinds of adornments, like an illustrious bride or a decorated sword. I could say there's a great story about Sikbar, but there's actually a ton of stories about this. This was truly a beloved dish. And perhaps my favorite is just the simplest, which is that the Caliph held a cooking competition, invited people from all over to cook their favorite dish, and everybody cooked vinegar stew, and most importantly, nobody was surprised. 
The other story that's very close to my heart is a story of how the uh, chef of the Kelly's Kitchen would come and play chess with a group of friends. And they asked him, you're such a great chef, why, why don't you cook for us? And he said, all right, what would you like me to cook? And of course they asked him to make vinegar stew. And he said, well, who normally cooks for you? And they say, it is our young servant boy here. And he says to the boy, bring me the cooking pot that you normally cook this in. And he does, and he smells, and he says, okay, take it away and clean it really well. And the boy does, and he says, bring it back. And he smells it, and he says, that's great. Clean it again and rub it out with clay. And the boy does that, and he brings it back, and he smells it, and he says, you see where this is going, right? Take it away, clean it, rub it out with clay, and rub it with sweet herbs. And the boy does that, and he comes back, and the chef smells it, and he pronounces it good, and he says, now cook it just as you normally would. He does, and everyone pronounces it the best vinegar stew they'd ever had. And the thing that really strikes me is this is precisely the kind of story that is told today in Michelin-starred kitchens, except it's a thousand years old. If you want a wonderful recipe for this, find it in our cookbook, A History of the World in 10 Dinners. Take care. Hello, my name is Victoria Flexner. I'm a food historian, the founder of New York City Historical Dining Collective Edible History, and the author of A History of the World in 10 Dinners. One of my favorite historical recipes is dope. Um, yes, it might not be as old as many of the recipes I traditionally examine in my work, um, but I have a bit of a sentimental attachment to this Southern French stew. Daube is a traditional Provençal stew from the south of France. My father, who is from Nice, grew up eating this. My grandmother apparently excelled at making daube. Um, and I also grew up eating it. Today, it is one of my favorite dishes to serve for friends or family when you feel like doing something a bit special. And I say special because this stew takes time. You put a couple pounds of good quality stewing beef in a big bowl and you pour over an entire bottle of red wine. You season it with salt and pepper and herbe de Provence, and then you let it stand for 24 hours so that the meat really soaks up all that red wine. The next day, the actual cooking of the stew begins. Uh, pancetta, onion, garlic, tomatoes, the beef, and the red wine all come together in the pot and cook very slowly for hours until the meat just kind of falls apart in your mouth. It's savory, it's warm, it's delicious. And I think what makes this such a fascinating recipe with some history behind it is how incorporated this dish was into the fabric of daily life in Nice. In the old days in Nice, people would greet each other on the street with va bene la doba, literally, how is the dobe, uh, which was kind of a slang greeting for, you know, hey, what's up, how's it going, to which someone would reply with plan plan, which means slowly, slowly, like how slowly the stew cooks. And if you're thinking that va bene la doba doesn't sound very French, that's because Nice was actually not a part of France until 1860. Before that, Nice was Italian. And so you see not only in the Niçois slang, which is a blend of local dialects and Italian, hence va bene la doba, but also in the ingredients of the dough, tomatoes, we immediately think Italian. Uh, and this is what differentiates a southern beef stew from that of a northern French, you know, beef bourguignon. But if you go even a little bit closer here, we know that tomatoes um, do not, in fact, originate in Italy, though they are a critical component of Italian cooking today. Tomatoes come from Mexico and were not introduced to Europe or any other part of the world, for that matter, until the Spanish and the Portuguese brought them from the Americas to the rest of the world after 1492. So there are layers here to this stew. And in this sense, dobe kind of embodies everything that I love about a historical recipe. It doesn't just tell one story, it tells many stories from many different time periods. As each ingredient arrives from one corner or another, each with its own tale to tell, they, they all kind of go in the pot together. And then as they cook, it becomes this whole new gustatory narrative that is born with its own story. Um, which I think is quite beautiful, actually, and, of course, quite delicious.
For last, I've left my own favorite um, engine recipe. And for those of you who follow me for a while, there's no surprise that um, perhaps my favorite recipe of the many, many, many that I've cooked and tried and talked about for four years, it's um, one that has been alluded to from um, ancient papyrus found in Egypt from the Hellenistic era. And this is um, obviously just fragments of the recipe and um, the happy accident of the dry climate and a pile of ancient rubbish basically left um, a lot of um, writings from the Greco-Roman Egyptian life. So this is from the Oxyrinhus papyri, which uh, it's a group of manuscripts discovered um, in the late 19th and early 20th century by the papyrologists uh, Bernard Pine Grefnell and Arthur Surridge Hunt. So this one is um, something like a pork stew, smoked pork stew, um, with um, a sauce made either from wine vinegar and grape juice with lots of herbs and spices. Um, something like there was fennel, there was aniseed, black pepper, mustard seeds, coriander seeds, thyme. And in a sense, yeah, you roast this and then you cook it in the liquid and then you serve it with a sauce made with a grape and vinegar and honey and black pepper. And yeah, for me, this is a, a very, first of all, very popular recipe. I've made it many times and it's very successful. And one of my favorite because it's, has elements that we recognize as well today. And there's all this um, mixture of uh, spices, which reminds me of uh, Southern USA type of barbecue. You have the dry rubs, you have wet uh, elements, you have vinegar, honey, so you have sweet and sour. And it's something that seems to be timeless and uh, uh, throughout uh, humanity. And of course, yeah, so it's a complex recipe with lots of tastes. It has pork, which was a very popular uh, meat back uh, in, in the ancient Mediterranean and um, still is in Greece at least and um, Italy and uh, Spain and Portugal and of course um, it's a hearty tasty recipe with um, all the elements that um, create like a full meal delicious and um, unique so yeah this is mine smoked salted pork cooked with spices in a honey vinegar and grape sauce. This is a recipe I talk about um, on the episode uh, Recipe Books Buried Under the Sand, Season 1, Episode 29, all the way back in August 2021. It's a real privilege to be, to be doing this now for more than four years. When I started in January 2020, um, just before the pandemic um, hit Europe, I was thinking that um, I'll do a few episodes about ancient Greece and Rome, and that would be it. But uh, the more I was doing it, the more, the more stuff, new recipes from all over the world, ancient dishes, and um, new information and knowledge was coming into light, and so many interesting things, and so many people out there that um, they are um, investigating the food of the past with many great stories to tell. And um, I couldn't basically stop doing this. So 100 episodes later, and there are definitely another 100 more <laughs> to follow. And I would like to thank all the listeners, you who are listening to the podcast every week, and um, keep supporting it. And of course, all my Patreon backers, who without them, this wouldn't be possible. Anyway, remember, if you want to keep this podcast happening, uh, you can subscribe on Patreon and become a patron from $3 a month. There are different categories and you can select higher ones. We get more benefits. And of course, everybody gets the podcast early and ad-free, which is very important. In any case, if you can't support on Patreon, uh, you can um, share the podcast with your friends and um, uh, leave a rating on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts, a review, and um, yeah, tell three of your friends about um, the podcast and help it grow this way. If we get more Patreon backers, uh, I endeavor to do a lot more videos more regularly. And of course, that will be helping with the costs of uh, the video recipes. Anyway, 
that's enough from me. Thanks for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. See you soon.